Hi guys. It is an absolutely spectacularly gorgeous, over-the-top beautiful day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization in lovely Fort Myers, Florida here on this gorgeous Monday morning, January 21st. 2019 so I am down here in Florida enjoying South Florida while I still can on this gorgeous Monday morning uh, while the rest of the people in the world do whatever they do choose to do with their lives on Monday morning I choose to go kayaking down a beautiful uh, beautiful Florida River today and so the little dog and I hopefully who will not be eaten by an alligator on this beautiful Florida River need to pack up our kayaks and head out into the wilderness but before I do uh, or we do uh, I need to bring you my combination doomsday sermon from that other channel and the today's chronicle of the collapse. I love it when the very same article uh, lets me wear both of my hats down here in the Doomosphere and I want to thank brother Chris Hedges for coming to my rescue again. I totally forgot it was I was supposed to deliver a sermon uh, yesterday but apparently Chris, who is an ordained Presbyterian minister, did you realize that Chris Hedges, he, was not, he did not go to journalism school. He went to seminary school uh, is where he actually got his education. And then, of course, he's also a columnist for Truth Dig, and his <clears throat> sermons come out every Monday morning. So this is literally the sermon that Chris Hedges uh, delivered yesterday on the, on the midpoint of the Donald Trump presidency. He delivered this sermon yesterday, January 20th, at Christ Church Cathedral in Victoria, British Columbia, Canada. And I am going to put the link... <coughs> to Chris's sermon on here and encourage you to shut me up and just go read it yourself. But if you want to listen to some old depressed collapsitarian sit here on this lovely uh, winter morning, winter Monday morning, I will be happy to do that for you. So without further ado, take it away. Chris Hedges with your sermon, your doomsday sermon, titled Confronting the Culture of Death. Confronting the Culture of Death. <clears throat> the issue before us is death. Not only our individual death, which is more imminent for some of this this morning than others, but our collective death. We have begun the sixth great, great mass extinction driven by our 150 year binge on fossil fuel. The litany of grim statistics is not unfamiliar to many of you. We are pouring greenhouse gases into the atmosphere at 10 times the rate of the mass extinction known as the Great Dying, which occurred 252 million years ago. The glaciers in Alaska are, alone are losing an estimated 75 billion tons of ice every year. The oceans, which absorb over 90% of the excess heat trapped by greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, are warming and acidifying, melting the polar ice caps and resulting in rising sea levels in oxygen-starved dead zones. We await a 50 gigaton burp or pulse 
of methane from thawing Arctic permafrost on the East Siberian Arctic self shelf, which will release about two-thirds of the total carbon dioxide pumped into the atmosphere since the beginning of the industrial era. <clears throat> Some 150 to 200 species of plant, insect, bird, and mammal are going extinct every 24 hours, 1,000 times the natural or background rate. This pace of extinction is greater than anything the world has experienced since the disappearance of the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. Ultimately, feedback mechanisms will accelerate the devastation and there will be nothing we can do to halt obliteration. Past mass extinctions on Earth were characterized by abrupt warming of 6 to 7 degrees Celsius. We are barreling toward those numbers. The mathematical models for this global temperature rise predict an initial 70% die-off of the human species culminating with total death. That is the opening paragraph of Presbyterian minister Chris Hedges father of four. Well, I think he's a biological father of three with one adopted child. <coughs> anyway, so now uh, <coughs> Chris Hedges has to go look for who to blame for this. The corporate forces that have commodified the natural world for profit have also commodified human beings. We are as expendable to global corporations as the barrier reef or the great sequoias. These corporations and ruling elites which have orchestrated the largest transfer of wealth upward in human history with the globe's richest 1% now owning half the world's wealth kneel and force us to kneel before the dictates of the global marketplace. They have seized control of our governments, extinguishing democracy, corrupting law, and building alliances with neo-fascist and authoritarians as the ruling ideology of neoliberalism is exposed as a con. They have constructed pervasive and sophisticated systems of internal security, wholesale surveillance, and militarized police, along with criminalizing poverty to crush dissent. These corporate capitalists are the modern version of the Can Can Canaanite priest who served the biblical idol Moloch, which demanded child sacrifice. And, as in this ancient Canaanite religion, it is our children who are being sacrificed to these mute idols, as 1 Corinthians put it. Their future is being taken from them. These corporate forces are, in biblical terms, forces of death. They will, unchecked, create more human misery and death than the evils of Nazism and Stalinism combined. Then he quotes Walter Benjamin. <clears throat> Quoting Walter Benjamin, actually, I hardly feel constrained constrained to try and make head or tail of this condition of the world. On this planet, a great number of civilizations have perished in blood and horror. Naturally, one must wish 
for the planet that one day it will experience a civilization that has abandoned blood and horror. In fact, I am inclined to assume that our planet is waiting for this, but it is terribly doubtful whether we can bring such a present to its hundred or four hundred millionth birthday party, and if we don't, the planet will finally punish us, its unthoughtful well-wishers, by presenting us with the last judgment." Close quote. <clears throat> Religious back, back to Chris. Religious belief to be relevant must be grounded in this concrete and bitter human reality. It must name radical evil not as an amorphous theological concept, but as Christ did when he named the evils of the rich, the Pharisees and the Roman Empire. It must eschew self-preservation for only he who loses his life can save it in the mortal struggle against the forces of death. It must speak in a negative, critical voice like the Hebrew prophets condemning the dominant corporate culture. The point of faith is not to give us hope. It is to name and defy the forces of death. Faith is not centered around the question, how is it with me? This is part of the narcissism of the dominant culture. Faith does not reside <coughs> in infantile fantasies about inevitable human progress or personal schemes for unachievable happiness. Faith defies magical thinking. It defies our culture and historical amnesia. It is the counterweight to the conditioned helplessness peddled by mass culture, the flight from reality that ensures our capitulation and our immolation on the altar of Moloch. Faith, finally, is about the belief, as Daniel Berrigan once told me, that the good draws to it the good, even if all the empirical evidence around us says otherwise. We demand justice not because we will win, but because we must. Thank you uh, for Chris, uh, for, for summing up the reason uh, I do what I do with my life. <clears throat> Corporate culture, like all cultures of death, makes war on love, truth, justice, and beauty, and numbs us to the questions about the search for meaning and the struggle to face our mortality. It spreads the dark viruses of hedonism, sexual sadism, greed, the cult of the self, the lust for power, hyper-masculinity, and the glorification of violence. It seeks to crush the transcendent. It lacks the capacity for empathy, awe, and reverence. It is the enemy of the sacred. <clears throat> Nothing in life has an intrinsic value beyond a monetary value in this culture of death. All living entities are herded toward Moloch's altar, the only ethical 
and religious response is to smash the idols and drive the high priest from Moloch's temple. This is quoting Dietrich Bonhoeffer from Ethics. Take it away, Dietrich. The nothingness into which the West is sliding is not the natural end, the dying, the sinking of a flourishing community of peoples. Instead, it is again a specifically Western nothingness, a nothingness that is rebellious, violent, anti-God and anti-human, breaking away from all that is established, it is the utmost manifestation of all the forces opposed to God. It is nothingness as God. No one knows its goal or its measure. Its rule is absolute. It is a creative nothingness that blows its anti-God breath into all that exists, creates the illusion of waking it to new life, and at the same time sucks out its true essence until it too disintegrates into an empty husk and is discarded. Life, history, family, people, language, Faith. The list could go on forever because nothingness spares nothing and fall all fall victim to nothingness. Close quote. <clears throat> Religion as H. Richard as H. Richard Nibur wrote is a good thing for good people and a bad thing for bad people. And religion as seen in the Christian right, which articulates and promotes white supremacy and Christian fascism, now rapidly filling Donald Trump's ideological void, is anti-religious. The idol of a personal God, one that caters to and promotes the interests of those who profess homage to it, is the idolatry of Moloch. It is self-worship. It is heretical and one of the most egregious failures of the liberal church has been its refusal to denounce these Christian heretics. The tacit toleration of these Christian heretics gave them religious legitimacy. You do not need to, as I did, spend three years at Harvard Divinity School to understand that Jesus did not come to make us rich, did not bless the white race above other races. Jesus, after all, was a person of color. It was the Romans who were white, or Jesus did not come to sanctify the American Empire's dropping of iron fragmentation bombs for 18 years up and down the Middle East. This is the theology of the Antichrist, as we heard in the reading this morning from the book of John. It speaks only to itself. Those we battle as the society and the ecosystem disintegrate, will increasingly appropriate the language of religion. They will seek to sanctify evil. These Christian fascists, like all idol worshipers, endow themselves with absolute power and authority. They claim to speak and act for God, they externalize evil, 
evil for them is not the constant struggle to combat the dark forces within our own hearts, but is embodied in the demonized other, Muslims, immigrants, blacks, feminists, artists, intellectuals, or homosexuals, and once the other is eradicated, evil itself will somehow miraculous be, miraculously be eradicated. Except, of course, it won't. And these Monitians will, in frustration, oppress and kill new groups of demonized human beings with an even greater fury. These beliefs common to fundamentalists who can come in secular form as we see in the new atheist are the ideological cover for an emerging dystopia. We will endure only by, invent, by inverting the world's values. To resist radical evil saves us as Soren Kierkegaard wrote, from slipping into that loathsome void, that torment of despair. Hope comes by way of defeat when we pit ourselves against the culture of death, and this means performing acts of civil disobedience and noncompliance it means becoming an outlaw in the eyes of the corporate state, then suffering and even death does not have the last word. Alexander Solzhenitsyn in the Gulag Archipelago describes prisoners in his camp organizing a work stoppage and hunger strike. Right, Solzhenitsyn, quote, What the bosses would do, no one could predict. We thought that perhaps they would start firing on the huts again from the towers. The last thing we expected was any concession. We had never in our lives wrested anything from them and our strike had the bitter tang of hopelessness. But there was a sort of satisfaction in this feeling of hopelessness. We had taken a futile, a desperate step. It could only end badly, and that was good. Our bellies were empty, our hearts were in our boots, but some higher need was being satisfied. During those long, hungry days, evenings, nights, 3,000 men brooded over their 3,000 sentences, their families, their lack of families, all that had befallen and would yet befall them. And although the hearts in thousands of breasts could not beat together, and there were those who felt only regret, only despair, Yet most of them kept time. Things are as they should be. We will keep it up to spite you. Things are bad. So much the better. Getting back to Chris. <coughs> this struggle to nurture and protect life, the sacred, has always been Pyrrhic. But it is our call the cross we are commanded to carry. It is what makes us human. It is what sustains the dim, absurd compassion and human kindness, love itself, which evil with its machines and bureaucratic power, its armies, its lies, its industrial violence, its wealth and its vast megaphones has never been able to crush and never will. It may 
not be a battle we can win, but by fighting it, we sustain ourselves. We are enveloped and absolved by the sacred, by God. We make faith possible. The poet Linda Gregg writes in Chosen by the Lion, quote, in the museum print room today, we looked at their Blake engravings. All were about a place that was not paradise. Everybody suffering, men on their backs, their faces upside down and exposed, legs raised and merging with the lines that meant a mountain women, unusually large, stood composed, discerning, concerned over the general condition of life. The curator said he cut directly into the metal. Then inked it, I said. Yes, she said. There was a spiral of mist filled with the shapes of lovers. I looked close to see if any were happy. At least two were and in the sky, a couple sitting, embracing. Something weeps in me all the time, all the time. I said at random, wouldn't it be nice if one of these prints showed an angel crossing the border between heaven and this other realm? Just the border. Jesus, you are above all others. I hurt constantly inside, bleared with loneliness, exhausted by keeping what I love safe. Amen, uh, brother. Uh, brother <clears throat> Chris Hedges. We're a little Monday morning religion here in the collapse of global industrial civilization. And, uh, you know, I, I am asked why I don't uh, give Christians more of a hard time on YouTube. And uh, I, I am not a Christian myself, but uh, amen to those real Christians who get it and understand things are not looking good on the planet, but as bad as things look on the planet, here in Fort Myers, Florida, the single fastest growing city in the United States, which will be going underwater in the next few weeks, it is a gorgeous day, a gorgeous day to be alive on this beautiful planet. And uh, the little dog and I are going to celebrate our freedom from freeing ourselves from the corporate machine. And we're going to go climb in a kayak and uh, go spend a few hours communing with nature on this beautiful planet while we still can. And hopefully the little dog will not be eaten by an alligator. I hope you will not become one with nature, little dog. You need to stay in the kayak. Get out there and enjoy this planet while you still can, for we all go underwater. Bye, guys.